Hello and welcome to Bolt Action Reloading. In today's video we'll be discussing how we are going to come up with our initial load details for our 6mm Creedmoor Reloading Project. Stick around. Welcome back to the channel. If this is your first time here and you'd like to see how I and the rest community here make our group smaller, start now by subscribing to the channel and hitting the bell icon. That way you'll get notified when I post new videos and you won't miss anything. At this point I'm going to assume that you guys have seen the equipment video that I made telling you about the certain equipment you might need to start reloading for 6mm Creedmoor. If not, I'll put a card up and you can go check that video out. That video should pretty much cover all the equipment that I needed to purchase to actually start our 6mm Creedmoor reloading project. In this video, we're pretty much going to talk about all the little details that we needed to do to actually come up with information that's actually going to generate our initial loads for 6mm Creedmoor. Now, I hate to give any order importance for these because all the information is important. I'm not sure it has to be generated in any specific order, but obviously your loading process has to be done in a specific order. Brass has to be first. So, we'll just start out today's video in this particular case. One of the most important things when we start a project is actually understanding the platform which we're reloading for. I'll put a quick shot on your screen and you can see that this is actually our Ruger Precision Rifle chambered in 6mm Creedmoor. This is the rifle that we're going to talk about loading for for this project. All the information that we will discuss will be specific to my rifle. However, some of the information will translate, some of it may not. In this particular reloading project, we're starting with 150 cases of brand new brass. 100 from Lapua and 50 from Peterson. Like I said, brand new brass, never been fired. And so therefore, you won't see all of the equipment in, that we talked about in the video on the table. In this particular case, we've actually measured our cases. As you can hopefully see, I've got a headspace gauge in there. We wanted to make sure all of our brass was actually going to chamber in the rifle. And if it was going to chamber, we were simply going to straighten out our necks with our Sinclair Expander Mandrel to actually prep this brass to get ready to shoot. However, if the brass is not properly chambered in the rifle or if there was any consistencies, we would be doing a full length resize on all the brass, making sure everything was true and consistent before we actually started reloading. But the brass prep is typically so good on this that we're just going to make sure our necks are the right diameter, take a couple of measurements to make sure that our head spacing is consistent, and once we've done that, we know that our brass is good to use. If you don't have a headspace gauge, you could probably just put the brass in the rifle to ensure that it chambers. However, in this particular case, I've done both. The one exception today is that since we have already fired 15 rounds of factory ammo, we're also going to actually decap and reload 15 pieces of Hornady brass as well. But that's kind of a side project. Our main reloading project will involve everything you see on the table. One other thing is actually making sure our brass is the right length. I might do a video comparing the brass specifically from Lapo and Peterson. Both of these brands so far I've found to be excellent brass, and when I did all the actual length measurements, both brands of brass were very close to the 1.910 inch trim length. No further brass prep other than making sure the neck diameter is set correctly will be required. One of the things that we also need to talk about is load data, because you're going to find the trim length in the load data. There's two primary sources of 6 mm Creedmoor data out there that we're going to talk about today, one being from Hornady and the other from Sierra. And truthfully, guys, most of our discussion today were completely evolve around Sierra's load data. Whoever's load data you're going to base your loads on, you can, should be able to go to the front of the thing and see the actual trim length and all the measurements on the brass to make sure your brass is not too long. For example, if you were using the factory brass and you needed to trim it, if it was past 1.9120, you would need to trim it back down to make sure it's underneath that maximum dimension. But like I said, for the brass we're talking about, all we're doing is resetting our neck tension and making sure that everything is good. Going down the line, both of these particular types of brass are small rifle primer brass. And that will explain why the CCI 41 primers are on the table. Not to reference too many different videos, but I'll put up another card if you guys want to go check out. The primer video that I did, again this is 6.5 Creedmoor, not 6mm Creedmoor, but in this particular case, for our initial loads, we're going to hope the testing we did in that video will translate to these reloads and hopefully give us equally good performance, or at least our best chance at it. The CCI 41s actually gave us very good performance with some of our load testing. That's why we're picking these. Another primer that I might discuss is the Fed 205 Match AR. They worked very well, but specifically why I mentioned those two primers is they're, those are both hard cut primers. One of the things that we had issues with in 6.5 Creedmoor on small rifle primer brass, because yes, they have both available. Both large and small rifle primer brass is available depending on the brand that you're using. When we were using small rifle primer brass in 6.5 Creedmoor, we did have a reasonable amount of primer crating that was occurring. 
primers such as the Remington 7.5 BR were showing more cratering than others. And so I pretty much moved to trying to find a reasonable thicker cup primer so that that primer cratering isn't causing us to keep our loads lower than what we might have to should we had a slightly harder cup primer. Now you guys will see the modified case on the table. We're going to talk about that discussion as we actually talk about the bullets. For no particular reason, we're going to start with the lightest bullet and go to the heaviest. Starting with the 105 Burger, probably actually has our highest probability of good performance, at least if availability is any indication. It's almost impossible to find these consistently, at least as long as I've been looking for them. This particular projectile has a G1 ballistic coefficient of 0.536, a G7 of 0.275, and honestly, with our 1 in 7.7 .7 inch twist barrel, we should have no issue stabilizing this guy. And honestly, of all the bullets on the table, will probably give us our best opportunity to shine. For this particular projectile, we're going to be looking at Sierra's H4350 data for their 107. Being the 107 and 105 are very close in weight, we're going to go to that low data for our starting charges. And really, for our initial loads, we're not trying to break any speed records here. We're just trying to make sure that we have a good starting place and give us an indication of what kind of accuracy and standard deviations we might be able to achieve with our loads to see what we would like to pursue next. The data indicates for H4350 that we should be able to hopefully attain a velocity of around 3100 feet per second with this combination. And obviously we'll certainly start well below max and work up, but that would be our goal. Now next for the 105, we're also gonna be trying IMR4451. Again, leaning on Sierra's data for the 107, the theoretical maximum velocity according to the load data would be 3050 feet per second. And if the shoot lights out, we really might not care about the 50 feet per second, but realistically, until we do the testing, we don't really know. Going up the weight class here, we're gonna go up to the 107 grain Sierra Match King. The part number is 1570. And according to the box, as you can see, this only requires a one and eight inch twist barrel. Our barrel should have no problem stabilizing these either. Obviously that G1 ballistic coefficient of 0.547, we would hope that it would buck the wind just a little bit better than the burgers. And as long as it shot groups that were just as good, that would be an optimal choice, assuming we can achieve the same velocity that we could in the burger. But until we shoot it, we really won't know. Our estimated velocity will again be 3,100 feet per second. And simply because at least for 6.5 Creedmoor, we had such good luck with H4350, we're going to test it as well. Instead of the IMR4451 being our second load, we're going to hop over to Reloader 16. Reloader 16 is also theoretically tops out at 30, 50 feet per second, the same as our low data did for IMR 4451. It's also worked very well as in 6.5 Creedmoor, and honestly, probably one of my go-to powders in 6.5 Creedmoor, just as much as H4350. Going a little heavier down the road here, we're going to go to the Sierra Match King in the 110 grain variety. And as you can see on the package, one and seven inch twist is what they recommend. Like I said before, 1.7 and seven inch twist is what our platform has. And so these might not actually work very well. They might not stabilize in our rifle. At least that's our concern. There are certainly reports out there where people with slower twist barrels have been able to succeed in successfully loading these. So we might as well give them a try. Now for this particular projectile, our theoretical max achievable velocity is slightly higher with Reloader 16 than it is with H4350, at least this projectile. We're gonna actually go with the low data for Reloader 16. And speaking of velocity, the actual highest velocity powder that we have on here is Superformance. Now, I don't have it on the table, but it will be our second choice for the 110 to try out. I don't expect to get spectacular standard deviations and statistics with those loads, but when it does have the highest theoretical velocity achievable in the load data, we certainly might as well give it a try. Now, as you guys will see the last projectile down the road here, and certainly wishing for the best and preparing for the worst with our particular load performance is the 115 grain DTAC. I believe this projectile also recommends a one and seven inch twist barrel and people that have them have certainly reported excellent performance with this projectile. Just to prove whether or not we can, we did procure some of these DTACs and to make sure we give them the best possible opportunity, we're going to go with our old reliable H4350. Now for this, we did not have any particular exact load data for this. And so if you'd like to go onto like Hodgkin's website to see an H4350 starting charge, we're actually going to use our Hornady brass to do a pressure test. So we'll slightly increase our charge looking for pressure signs to make sure we're not going to over pressure our rifle right out of the gate and see if these will stabilize. Assuming these will actually stabilize, and I'm sure I will show you guys that video. If we don't get good stabilization, we probably won't make a whole lot of videos on that. But if we do get good stabilization, we will certainly be performing more load tests with that projectile on the channel. All that out of the way, it might seem like we we're almost done, but we're not there yet. 
we're gonna talk about the overall length gauge that you see on the table. Now, without deluging too far into rumor and speculation, there have been some rumor and speculation for the Ruger Precision Rifle Chamber and 6mm Creedmoor having a short throat and actually hitting the lands with some factory ammunition, which for a factory gun, from what I understand, if it's not basically unheard of, it's certainly very uncommon. Our overall length gauge and our modified case will be a very important tool. For every single one of these projectiles, I've actually already measured my distance to the lands. That is where we'll get our final piece of load data. We'll be looking at Sierra's data to actually give us our charge weights to make sure we start safe and work up, but we will also be making sure that our cartridge overall lengths listed in that data for those charge weights are safe to shoot in our rifle without hitting the lands. Having the bullets into the lands could cause a pressure spike and not necessarily be safe to shoot in the rifle. That being said, assuming for our 105s we're going to use Sierra's data, we're going to assume a cartridge overall length of 2.800 is what rec is recommended. Again, I'm not going to promise what it will be in your rifle, even if you have a Ruger Precision rifle, because every rifle is a little different. We actually found out that on several different readings with several different projectiles, that our cartridge overall length to the lands would have been at 2.828 inches. So if we load at 2.80, we should have 28 thousandths to the lands. If you guys are interested in cartridge-based ogive, that measure on this, that particular projectile at 2.828 is 2.226. Moving right along the 107s, the 107 cartridge overall length. Actually, I tested with several different projectiles, had a little bit of an issue getting a consistent reading, especially the CVTO moving back and forth, which I found to be unusual. But basically, the cartridge overall length to the lands with the 107s ranged anywhere between 2.802 and 2.807. CPTO varied between 2.238 and 2.245, again, depending on the projectile. In this particular case, I'm going to just go with the 2.800 inches to start with and assume that it is going to be slightly off the lands. Moving up the chain to the 110 grain Sierra Match King, the actual load data that Sierra gives for this projectile has a cartridge overall length of 2.875 inches. But if you were using the magazine that actually comes with a rifle, 2.840 inches is as long as you would be able to load, but since I am using the, the AICS magazines, 2.875 is actually achievable. Just to make sure there's a little bit extra clearance, I'm going to bump that down to 2.870 inches, but when we actually measure the cartridge overall length to the lands in this particular rifle, the actual cartridge overall length appears to be 2.886, give or take a thousandths either way. CBTO varies, but again, by testing multiple bullets, our CBTO actually varied slightly, anywhere from 2.222 to 2.227. Moving down the lane to these 115 DTACs, 2.800 is kind of what a factory standard. You'd think that is what we'd be shooting for in this rifle. However, when we actually measure the cartridge overall length, 2.794 and 2.793 were popular readings that we got when we were measuring the distance to the lands with this rifle. Cartridge based ogive would have been again 2.227 or 8 depending on your reading. I certainly don't want to be right up against those lands. I'm actually going to back the cartridge overall length on that particular load development to 2.780 as a starting point and see where we find pressure moving forward. I think it's pretty much going to cover everything as far as the load details of how we're going to start this project. It certainly may not be where we end up, but you've got to start somewhere and we're going to make sure we use some of the reliable powders that we found in 6.5 Creedmoor reloading. So even if you guys aren't interested in 6mm Creedmoor, I hope you guys enjoyed today's video. If you have any comments or questions, please post those in the comments section below. If you're not subscribed to the channel, what are you waiting for at this point? Hit the subscribe button, turn the bell notification on to get notified when I post next week's video. And until then, stay safe in small groups.